Uh, this is going to be fun. This is, uh, I guess, our, is this our last panel of the day? Great. Oh, it's yeah. Friday, yeah. Uh, and so uh, we have the great Helen Shaver with us tonight. The, th the session is called An Anatomy of a Scene, and we're going to deconstruct, or she's going to deconstruct because she's the director, uh, a scene from Orphan Black. And then we're going to get into talking about uh, directing in general, especially directing for television. Both of us are big fans of that. Uh, we we're just discussing the difference between TV and film right now and how great TV is. So um, I think we have it all set up for the Orphan Black episode that Helen did, and we'll take a look at that. And follow along on your script, right? Yeah, well, yeah, or well, hopefully you will be too riveted to follow along, <laughs> and it's too dark anyway. But uh, I, the scripts are there so we can look and see uh, what's on the page and what's on the screen and how it gets from here to there, because there's a lot of things on the screen that are not on the page. <laughs> Nice. I like that scene. Yeah. I sequence a lot. So uh, you probably haven't had too much chance to go over it, but I, I we as we talked out earlier up up in the uh, outside, we did talk a little bit about what's on the page and what you have to put on it and what's not on the page. So explain a little bit about that when you're a director. Yeah. Well, I mean, and and, and the reason I I had these the scripts printed out is is so that you could look and see what's there because. What's on the page, certainly, there's a, there, the, the narrative is on the page. The story's on the page. The, what happens to the character is on the page, which is different than the plot, right? So you've got the plot, you've got the character, what happens to the character. And, and within, a, within every script, it, there are, there's the story underneath the story, but that's, I think, largely what my work is to find so that, um, so that an emotional journey is taken from, with a point of view. And, the, and this, this scene, so, you know, we, we know that she's there in an infirmary and that she's very sick. Well, so how do you show very sick? And we know that she has to go into a dream state uh, and, and a tunnel is suggested. Um, and in the end, once she get, makes it through the tunnel, she's going to be in this, in, still in her dream, in, in in the kitchen, and she's going to encounter Beth. And Beth, in the end, is one more time going to kill herself. So what is it about? Uh, there, for me, so much of it is about this woman trying to reach out and find herself and her reason in others. And... And the truth of everything, which is that death is a is a like birth is a completely solitary event, and um, blah blah blah. So 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 how do you do that? I, you know, you, I I what how I do it is is I get all the obvious stuff together, and then I let myself dream and imagine, and start to see well, what what is it like for me inside a dream? Inside a dream, for me, do I always see how I get to one spot? Am I only in one spot? Does this time track the same way? And so from all of that, the choreography of the kitchen and popping her around the kitchen uh, um, became part of the whole thing. And then choosing the point of views, the point of view to tell the story inside the infirmary where she's sick. Uh, became really important. And, 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 and so to go from the objective, shoot the scene objectively, but know that I would begin the scene editorially in her eyes, that, that I would go in and out, use her eyes as the doorway to pass through into the different levels of consciousness and, 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 and experience the scene in the room both from an objective point of view and from how she was experiencing it so that the audience is forced to feel what she feels. And, um, and then you get into, you know, you have these imaginings and, uh, and then you come into a room with, you know, 100 people and, and find ways to communicate this with each individual. 
Now you have to help me here because clearly I'm going all off in circles. No, ask me, ask me questions. No, I'll that's, answer. That's great. I'll tell I, no lies. I want to know about that. I, and one of the things you said, you you have these visions, or you have. These. Yeah, that's how I work a lot. I'm very visual. It's interesting. I I, I was doing a pilot with a, a writer one, and I told her, you know, I was oh, I was waking up this morning, Barbara, and I, I had this vision of. Yeah, well, I don't know whether I was dreaming or I was awake, but anyway, I had this vision. She said, you have visions? I said, well, yeah. And she said, do you dream in pictures? I said, I think so, yeah. And she says, I don't. I dream in words, which is, so I, and I couldn't actually imagine dreaming in words, but I do. I have, I have, well, I think all my life I've been, my study has been humanity, it's been people, it, uh, and on one hand. And on the other hand, my, my sort of personal journey has been uh, coming to a place of willing to, be, willing to be present, to be in the now. Because in the now is where everything is, right? In time, you have all the time in the world. You have all the answers in the world, everything you need in the moment is always there, right? When, I, <clears throat> when, <clears throat> when you're just on the edges, when you're slipping in and out of the groove of the present, <clears throat> for me, that's the most uncomfortable place in the world. And you are always out of time when you're there. And the, where only joy exists in the moment, only fear, anxiety, resentment, insecurities, the, the, and all the constipation <laughs> that would never let a creative thing come through, and you, one one must go to one's techniques and and craft, you know, which I've had years to learn, uh, you know, so I can still operate from there. But it is work, and it is hard work. Whereas in the moment, it is a joyful, abundant place, and part of that for me is is seeing things, and oftentimes. When you have a script, the writer has is communicating their perception through words and telling you what they mean. But if it, the out of focus fan with the the naked lights coming through and blaring out tells the audience because they experience that what a page of of, of, of printed words could never say, nor could you ever have that experience from uh, a character saying, I was really sick and I saw the fan coming in and out of focus and the light was, you just, it would not be the same thing, right? So in making motion pictures, you have to make pictures <laughs> because they're worth more than words in, in, in some cases. And so anyway, I have a place that I go to, which is the present, and uh, several ways I get there. And when I'm there, whether it's when I'm just waking up or just going to sleep or when, the, when I'm doing body work or sometimes when I'm sitting at my desk just, just present to the material, I, I will see things. And that's where a lot of that came from and, 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 and the decisions of how to create the dream and how to show Beth. and. And you know, I also worked with a great editor afterwards who, who, la who really, uh, you know, hears my music. <laughs> you know, we, we, we really get each other. And he was the one who started pulling up the images of Paul jogging and stuff like that, which, which was just so brilliant. Uh, and because he, I just think it is the most amazing thing in, in, in understanding the same way as you understand a human being, which is not in a straight line, but with many complexities, but somehow elements coming together to create a whole, you know, I, 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 that is what making movies is about and doing a scene, uh, not just executing what is on a page before you. And when you get this, give us, a, uh, Helen, give us a little sense of um, how much time you have when you get this script to to uh, have your visions and, <laughs> right. uh, in a positive way, <laughs> yes. and, um, and and look at this and say, okay, I I because there's always a little bit as you see on there's a little bit of direction from the writer, but it's sure. not like directing the scene. Uh, so he's he or she or whoever's going to do it at mm -hmm. times, giving you a hint of what they want. But it's your job to pull it to life and make it 3D, right. uh, and not just be like as you so deftly put it, like 
speaking what happens is not the same as seeing no, what happens exactly. and all this stuff. So in this particular scene, when you were, how long did it take you to sort of come up with that? Um, and then is there a process when you go back to the writer and say, here's, here's how I want to do it? Yeah, well, I mean, it works differently with, with different writers, of course. I mean, um, <clears throat> this one actually stretched because of they'd had production delays and so on and so forth. So it ended up, I prepped at the beginning of December, shot half the episode before Christmas. Then there was a three-week hiatus, at the end of which my mother died, uh, literally on the Friday, and I went back to work on, on the Monday. My mother was 101 and a half, and, 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 and she lived and died very well. But, but I, was still, I still went back into this, and, and so interestingly, I, I would say, I shot the, I shot, no, I shot all of this after my mother died. Uh, this whole sequence, actually. I was going to say I shot the infirmary stuff before, which maybe I did, but, but certainly the, the Beth dream sequence. And, and, and where much of that had already come along, um, the, the, the solitariness of death and the, the emotional content of that moment of, of seeing someone go, of crossing the threshold, and not being able to follow, to help, to stop, that the humanity of that moment um, was very, uh, and it wasn't like an intellectual process for me at, at the time. I'm, I, I'm intellectualizing it now in order to be able to communicate it, but it was a very instinctive thing. And, and now, I mean, all of my imaginings would be nothing without Tatiana Maslany, who is, I think, one of the most brilliant actors I, well, not I think, I know she is one of the most brilliant actors that I've ever encountered, either as an actor or a director. Uh, and, 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 and happily, in, 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 the, in the creative process, um, for a director, uh, the most important beginning point with your cast and crew is to, to trust them and for them to trust you to engender trust, because without trust, you're just in fear, and in fear, you're not in time, and so then it becomes this whole other thing. And Tatiana and I um, uh, recognized each other the first time we met, so, so that, that ha and, and, and so I know that the, the visuals on that whole dream sequence really progressed after my mother died, which was very close up to to doing it, and 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 all, and and sometimes, sometimes when I get a big visual, I, I was telling. I'm going to actually talk about a different scene than this from Vikings because it's it's an easier scene in a way to break yeah, down. Yeah. <clears throat> in, uh, last year, when I was doing my first couple episodes of Vikings, there's a scene where the princess, the English princess, it's described that she's sitting in her chambers embroidering, <clears throat> and. Um, What's going to happen in that scene is we're going to find out that she's pregnant, uh, not by her husband, but by the priest, the priest who's a Viking, anyway, and that she's in love with him. And we know that by the end of the, I know because I've read the script, by the end of the two hours, uh, the Viking, uh, the, the priest is going to be killed. Uh, and so all... All, and in the scene, the husband, was, where she's sitting embroidering, the husband was going to come in and say, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? And she was going to say, I'm pregnant, and it's not your child. More eloquently, but that was, and he was going to get really upset, and she was going to cry, and next thing we know, he's going to have her ear cut off. But in that scene, that, 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 that's what was going to happen. And um, so I was just sitting, looking in my office, looking at the script, and, and I, I saw her her sitting in front of this window embroidering, and I, I, I saw it like a, a holy card of sort of the Virgin Mary, because I grew up in the Catholic Church, and so I have images of these holy cards from when I was a little girl. And I, oh, and I, and I thought, well, let me look closer and see what she's embroidering. And I, as I looked, I saw that it was a little round, white, and that she was embroidering a, a little gold cross on it. And I thought, oh. What's that for? And then I realized, oh, she's embroidering something for her baby clothes, you know, like the smocking on a, on a baby gown. And, and, and then in my imagining, I saw the needle come through the cloth and prick her finger. And which I, you know, and I'm going, oh, like, 
you know, like Snow White. You know, oh. and, 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 and I thought, oh, the blood, the blood, the white, the, oh, sh the blood will drop on the cross and, because Athelstan's going to get killed. And, and, and then I thought, no, well, and then I pick up the finger and she quit, presses it and blood comes out a little bit, a big thing of blood, and I saw her put it around her lips and taste it, remembering her lover and the taste of her lover and the kiss of her lover, who is the father of her child. And then now she has red blood, like lipstick on her lips, and now she can kiss the cross and make a Marilyn Monroe set of lips on top of it, which will, will all be, will resonate consciously, probably unconsciously, but will resonate when he is killed in naked, giving himself extreme unction in front of the, the rudimentary cross that he's, he's built. Um, so yeah, and now, and now in that case, Michael Hurst is the only writer in Vikings. He writes every word. So he was in Oxford, I was in Ireland. We'd met a couple of times, didn't know the guy at all really. Uh, but it was, I, it was coming the weekend, so I called him and I said, so Michael, just you know, tell me if I'm in the right arm, the right vein, am I anywhere close to anything that, it has anything to do with what you've written? And I told him what I just told you. And he said, oh, darling, that's fabulous. Yes, yes, I think that's a good, carry on, carry on. <laughs> and, and, you know, and the next iteration of the script, there, there were some of those descriptors in there. And, and so the creative conversation that goes between the writer and the director um, in, the, in, the, in the places where I like to work uh, is, is so exciting and so profound. And then you know, you come up with a script and then you come to the set and in the planning of technically how you're going to do it, you've, you've also added um, all the input from a lot of other people who are really good at their job and who also work visually or audioly or, and, and, you know, wardrobe has added in and sets have added in and now, and the DP uh, and the operators and everybody becomes involved. So, so the director is directing the entire thing and hopefully creating an atmosphere by working in the present and working without fear and recognizing what a joyful, liberating job we have. Like, you know, I mean, let's start with we're not in Syria, you know, uh, let's start, I mean, that this, the, we get to do this, that we get to make movies, big, small, but that we get to, that we get to brush up in a creative way with all the restraints and all the restrictions and all the possibilities with a bunch of other creative people who've also come to work that day to do the same thing with you. I mean, pretty exquisite. But anyway, so in the process, there's all these other elements that are added. And, and in the end, you know, you, you have, you have a that. Yeah. yeah. Now it's, it's, well, first of all, your dreams are amazing. It would be great to like wake up and like hear what she's had happened to her at night. Uh, so, Oh, yes. <laughs> right? Uh, I kind of thought so. Just the half of it. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> when you're putting this all together and you, uh, it, it, you really have to have all, the, all, this, all these parts have to work. You have to have the writer mm -hmm. because, as you well know, mm -hmm. not all the writers are going to be as... No, not but then you like don't him. work with them again. That's, That's very smart. I love right. when you said the people I like work with. Or the <laughs> yes. places I work, meaning you're only going to work places where you're going to have that freedom. My rent's paid. Right, yeah. exactly. So yeah. you don't really, you just choose projects that you're interested in. That's right, yeah. Right. And so, uh, and by the way, you must be having fun. You're, you're, uh, uh, you're, you're doing Orphan Black, you're shooting Vikings, and which has got to be great, right? Uh, Vikings is, uh, I mean, fun. yeah, Orphan Black is so much fun. Vikings is, I mean, come on. You know, you guys. Right, it's a Viking. It's yeah. Vikings. And then there are all, the, all this incredible beauty. We shoot on the Guinness estate mm -hmm. in Ireland, you know, these great actors and technicians, and you get to go play Vikings. Yeah. Well, when you look at a script like the Viking script, you, you say, well, how, how am I going to cut off this woman's ear today? Right. Well, actually, in the script, that was another one. In the script, she gave up the guy's name as soon as the knife came up to her ear. I said, Michael, come on. I mean, a couple of things here. One, how heroic is that not? And, 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 and two, if we're going to threaten uh, physical abuse of a woman, let's have a scar. Let's live with it. Don't just 
make, you know, let, let, let's have consequence to this. Let's, she's got long hair. It's not like you have to do a prosthetic every day. You know, she can wear her hair covering the ear that's not there. But if, it, if some man reaches out to touch her face, let's remember there's no ear there. And, and, and let's... You just want to cut her ear off. Well, yes, but, uh, but I also, uh, like, I mean, you know, another thing that I've really recognized, you know, I mean, you're all aware, you're all smart people, and I've, I'm sure I'm going to tell you stuff that you already know, but, like, for example, you know, there, there, there's no image of a woman that exists in the media that was not vetted by men, right? Uh, that it does not exist. I mean, and, and both men and women are, are um, suffer from that lack of understanding, a lack of exposure to actually who a woman is. And, and uh, you know, and it, and because it's been dominant for generations, I mean, if you have a five-year-old daughter, you can't take her anywhere and show her this is, this is a woman. She could only see her mommy and, and know that. But um, so, so while I love to, you know, Listen, I kill people, I cut ears off, I you know, raping, pillaging, you know. All, <clears throat> that does not that does not disturb me in a in a moral way as long as I've rooted the audience in an empathy with what's going on and that there is some reverberation from the violence. You know, that it, that it lives. Right. In some way, and is that something that you can bring to the projects you do? You, you obviously have a, a well, you know, yeah, personal code, really, as, as much as I can. You know, I certainly well, and even if even if the writing doesn't support it, I can make the audience care about the person. Mm. I mean, it, it, I think it's the way that you know, because listen, they don't. Um, I don't. I don't. There, the the opportunities for women. In uh, in filmmaking and television in North America are much more limited than the opportunities for men, for lots of reasons which we don't want to go into, and it's not it's not a chip I carry on my shoulder at all, but it's just a reality. Uh, but they don't. It's not an automatic. Oh, you know, here's a sixty year old woman. Let's give her a big action piece to direct. Right. This is not like an automatic. <laughs> Trust me on that. <laughs> and, Should definitely and, tweet that out. And uh, you know, but however, uh, so so, but because I have, so I I consciously went in because I wanted to be able to 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 deal with big scope, uh, and um, so I was very conscious after uh, judging Amy to choose some pieces like the unit. And, and some other things that are, haven't stayed on the air, so you're less familiar with them, uh, that, that had action and stuff in them to, to, be, to demonstrate, to learn myself, to find out whether I could, and to demonstrate that I can play in that sandbox. And, um, but what I, yeah, but what, and I think what has made the difference is that, that I do, find the emotional, the hum humanity within the, because, you know, we've all seen lots of stuns. Yeah. You know, we've all seen lots of killings. We've all seen, so what is it about? You know, people often say, think that sex scenes are exploitive uh, and worry about that a lot more. Uh, to me, I think that often the violent scenes are exploitive and, and, and that's where I really, really want to root humanity. Right. Well, it's, it, as a reminder, this uh, session is um, uh, this is sponsored by the Directors Guild of Canada, and so I, it's a great time to sort of say, you know, you've had a, an amazing career not only in front of the camera but behind it, and as as a woman directing television series and different ones of, of different size and scope. Mm. Um, how how long did it take you to to be able to say you say play in that sandbox where you say I can do Vikings? Or because a lot of women, yeah. it, 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 and a lot, you know, if you've seen Breaking Bad, I mean, there's a lot of great women filmmakers have done Breaking Bad and said, I can do this nastiness as well yeah. as a man. So yeah. did it, were you fighting that battle too? Well, I, I think it's just a natural one. I mean, it, you know, I was able to use the fact that I was an actor that Showtime wanted in a series. I, I used that as leverage to, to be able to direct, to begin directing. Uh, but certainly I've, I've gone, you know, I, I've sat with some fabulous, intelligent, 
genius writer producers uh, and and literally had well one of them literally said to me oh yeah Helen no well we used a woman once in the first year and she didn't get it she just didn't get it and I and, I, and you're just like oh my goodness were there any blue eyed men who missed I, 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 I you know, it does. It, you know, and and that is really changing a lot. I mean, really, I read a fantastic thing. Meryl Streep uh, yesterday was saying, "I don't. I. It, it makes me crazy when I'm asked why I like to play strong women. Are is there any leading man that is asked why he likes to play strong men? You know, it, it, these are these things. But anyway, I don't want to get into a whole <laughs> that whole sidebar because. Because seriously, if I'd thought about those things over the years, I wouldn't be doing what I, was, I am doing. I, I, I really, I, I actually very, um, it wasn't until about eight months ago that I, I allowed myself to, to think about this whole uh, discrepancy. Because if I'd thought about it, I, I wouldn't have gotten out of bed. Yeah. You know? So I just kind of go. Well, let's go back, let's okay. go back to the okay. uh, orphan yeah. black scene. And I, I'm interested in, uh, uh, partly for that one is, uh, because you run into these tropes that you do as writers do all the time, and, and as directors too, I can only imagine that shooting a, a dream sequence or a, and, and a death sequence is uh, you know you, you're running into some familiarity things, and, and you must think, okay, how do I make this fresh? You know, I never have that thought. Really? That's actually I never sit around saying, how do I make this different? I only every, all my shots for me come from how they make me feel because that's what I want to do to how the story I'm telling I don't I don't sit around I was actually just having this conversation I'm working with a couple of young writers on a feature that I'm going to direct that they wrote and and this one guy's going oh yeah no no and then you know you could do this right Helen because and then you follow because that would be a really cool shot and I'm like we haven't written the scene yet <laughs> the scene, there's like zero reason to think about a shot because a shot, for me, comes out of the storytelling. Not this. Yes, the storytelling that's going to support the, the narrative and the plot. Yes, the storytelling that is going to support the character arc. But m even more, the, the the what is going to what is going to make the container the the that holds the whole piece. You know that that. That, that's, and for me, that's not, the shots may end up being cool, but the shots that I do are to create that world where this can happen. So it's like a, it's like a nuclear, it's the, the, the what it encases the reaction of, of, of the nuclear reaction, right? I mean, that part. I, I, I know that when you're doing, um, back in my acting days, if you're doing a, uh, uh, an improvisation or uh, an exercise where one is the initiator, one is the actor, the other is the reactor. What you need is the third person who is the container. And to me, very much a role of a director, not just in the creative process on the set, but in in in, in looking at the piece of material. It is for you to be the container to to hold the whole thing. Uh, so that you're telling the story to the audience. And how do I do that? It's how it affects me. I know what's right when it affects me. And, um, yeah. Well, do you, I mean, I just, this kind of plays off of that, because when you were talking about your your mother and then the delays in the shooting, are there ever period, and that must be hard, too, you're shooting, you're shooting that scene after your... Hard, or, hard and good. Yeah. You know what I mean? Really, because what 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 else are you going to do with it? Right. You know, like all that. Well, did it, did it did it uh, change your approach to it in any way, or? I think I was profoundly open. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, it just I was in that I was really that that week of shooting was just a real uh, was a very okay. I'm I if I I'm here. You know, just very open, very... And Tatiana, I mean, again, it, it, there were moments where it was directly used. Um, uh, not in that scene, but in... Uh, there's a scene where, at the end of the movie, where Rachel is sitting there and she's looking at... She's painting a symbol and looking at her as a little herself as a little girl with her father. And, and I, mm -hmm. she wanted to break down. I wanted her to break down. And, and you know, it, 
she's brilliant. It was ha happening, and but there was something, and and I went. And she said, I, I I don't know. I I'm 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 kind of dry, Helen. And I just said, and these are things that just happen right in the moment. They're not contrived or thought of. I heard myself saying. I felt myself saying. Take mine, take mine, and she did, and it came, you know, and we rolled, and it was there. But that it's that communion um, that leads you into just all sorts of other directions, right? And I was very profoundly open, and it was a safe place because Graham and John and Aubrey, the man who wrote this, and because these people love and respect me, and I love and respect them, it was a very safe place to simply be. But at my age, I don't really know how to. Be anybody else. Everybody else is already taken, right? So <laughs> you kind of, kind of just have to show up. <laughs> well, I, I, I can only, you know, it seems pretty obvious that your role uh, as an actress prior to becoming a director must, in some ways, shape how you deal with uh, other actresses, whether it, or and actors, yeah. whether it's Tatiana or not. So, can you can you talk a little bit about what like a director is trying to to get out of a um, an actor, and then also an additional on top of that, what you bring because you've been on that side. I'm going to start with the second part first, I think. Um, I think if there is a, a preverbal wound shared by actors, I would think it is probably a preverbal wound of not being heard. I would say that. And then if there is a gift uh, to, to, to find a space where it's a stage or a sound stage or wherever it is where it's quiet on the set, and now speaking from your deep truth, in the imaginary circumstances, through the voice box of the character, you are heard. So I think that that's one thing. So, um, and, and you know, from from that deep understanding, layered with years of experience in terms of um, you know uh, craft and many many ways of working and all of that, I I don't have to pretend that I like actors. I don't have to pretend anything, you know. So, and actors, when you're working, no, no matter how you are in the rest of your life, when you're working, if you are, particularly if you're a good actor, uh, you are open to what is present. And if what is present is a group of people or a director who is afraid of you, and generally fear comes from lack of understanding, right? And, um, um, then, then it doesn't feel safe. Because if somebody's afraid of you, and they're acting that out either as, oh, darling, you're just, oh, you look so fabulous. Oh, then that was fabulous. I mean, please. Uh, or, or uh, you know, no, it's just, uh, whatever it is, however that fear manifests, it's, it's not conducive to giving a performance, which is not an accidental thing. So, so, so directors want them, directors want actors to give them their performance, I would think. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know what, because that's what the actor brings is the performance. But many directors, so that's what they want. So it, lots of people have lots of different ways of getting there. Scorsese, who I had the privilege of working with a couple of times, gets there with yes. I mean, he, he, he uh, yeah, yeah, or, yeah, I like that. Yeah, okay, okay. yeah we'll, we'll print that. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> you want to do it again? Okay, let's do it again. Okay, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you, were, you, you shouldn't be smoking, but you were smoking. Uh, you were having lunch with Paul, yeah. And, uh, you know, when you were talking to him? Okay, well, let's just do it again. You know, that's a sort of Martin Scorsese direction to me at that time in my life. Um, and the first day I thought, after I worked with him, I thought, oh my God, I'm such a bad actress that he doesn't e even know how to give me a direction. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> and then I noticed he was doing it with Sam Watterson. And then I went, oh yeah, okay. And then I just listened on a different level. And it, you know, uh, you know, but I have equally been with in situations where you're doing a scene, you're in a set, the monitors are out there, the director's out there, uh, you, you, you do the thing, they say, okay, we're going again. Nobody comes in and says a word, there are no notes, 
And so you, you do it again, and then, okay, keep rolling, back to the start, do it again. Okay, nothing, you know, and I have, you know, it was, a long, it was a while ago, I was younger and had less control of my tongue, but uh, I, <laughs> I, uh, um, I do recall in a situation like that after, and that was a scene where I had to start at normal, go through this big breakdown, you know. And after about the seventh time hearing myself filling the soundstage saying, if you could tell us in 25 words or less what the problem is or what you want, I'm sure we could do it. At which point the director finally came into the set. Uh, you know, so, the, you know, it's like, and I'm sure that director wanted to get the performance from the actors. I'm sure that every director goes there every day to, to make their day, to get their shots, to get do, 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 do. And in that, they have to get the thing from the director, uh, from the actors. But it's, it, there's, there's just like a lot of ways to. But clearly you learned not to do it that way. That's, oh my, you don't do that. Clearly. Oh my God, no. I mean, <laughs> oh my God, no. I mean, like, wh that, why? Why would you do that? I mean, for me, in my world, I mean, that's like. But have, but have you, you know, had, do you have tricks or things where you're talking to them and you're like, I really need to, you're trying to get them someplace and if they're not there, whether, I mean. I, yeah, I do. I mean, I actually, th the, I, I'm coming back to it again, but what I have found, the, I follow my instincts. What, but, but what I've found, basically, if the actor is not landing the performance, it's because they're not, in their body, you know, they're a millisecond before or after it, and they're, I mean, you know, this is an actor, if they know their lines, they know what the scene is, and, you know, if you're dealing with somebody who is not really an actor of whom you're trying to get a performance, that's a whole different thing, but, but if, if you're dealing with an actor, uh, and, and so I've found quite by accident that if I am, if I'm present, if I'm in my body, and, and I literally, go up to a person and put my hand on them and it doesn't really much matter what I say. Uh, and and it, when, they've, when they're finally in my eyes, if I'm ready to roll and I see they're there, we just roll and, and there it is, you know? Wow. You know, there's a... Uh, the uh, Helen Shaver touch. Well, or you know, it's like, okay, here's a story, Kind Daly. I was doing uh, Judging Amy and she was very angry with the writers because they'd, they'd sent her flowers that day uh, she got nominated for an Emmy, and and she'd been having an ongoing discussion. They shot. She thought they wrote too many scenes in which she had to cry, and so in this battle, in a sort of passive aggressive way, a writer had written, sent her flowers saying, "See, tears work." Well, it happened that that night, for the end of the episode, I needed her to cry. Yeah, that's what was written in the script, and um, and Tyne decided that she was never going to cry on that show again. <laughs> <laughs> that she, they would, she would shed no more tears for those writers. That was it. She's a very smart woman, a very great actor. And we discussed this, and I said, well, you know, yeah, we're cutting off a nose to spite the face. I mean, that's this, and this is us. And you know, it wasn't going anyplace. So the shots are all set up. There's rain, and we're making rain. I got a crane to pull back from the car. I've got the, th I've got the two cameras, a close up and a raking two. And Tyna said, has assured me that this scene did not need tears from her. And I said, well, there's a thousand ways to skin a cat. Give me what you got. I just need the end of the movie, Tyne. It just needs, it just need, I just, give me the end of the movie. And so she, five times, did a very fine, reasonably, I mean, I would say I'm verging on intellectual, but very fine, absolutely identical five takes the way the, to do this scene without crying. And I was just sitting there going, shit, it's Friday night, it's late, da, 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 the rain machines, the producers, oh my God. What am I gonna have? And I found myself walking over to her side of the car, rain machines had turned off, her, her window came down, and I crouched down. When I look back on it later, I, I realized I'd basically gotten on my knees. And I, and, uh, and I said, so, Okay, so is that it, Ty? Is that is that what you're going to give me? Because if if that's it, uh, uh, Uncle, you know, uh, Uncle, and she said, "Well, is what I'm giving given you not truthful?" And I said, "Absolutely, it's truthful, Ty. It's your work is beautiful. You're a truthful actress. It's it's truthful, but it's not the end of the movie." 
She's meanwhile reaching for her cam on filtered and lighting that, and tears are starting to well up in her eyes. And I said, so is that it, or are you, you're not gonna give me this? And she said, I've given all I have for this, to this scene. I said, really, Tyne? Okay, and now the tears are just welling right up. I said, you're, di you're just gonna smoke it away? Or I reached in and I took her cigarette. I was standing by this time and said, why don't you roll up your window? We'll do this one more time. And I walked away, smoked that baby <laughs> uh, as we rolled. And, and, you know, she wept and was nominated for another Emmy next year. Uh, uh, and, uh, I mean, and gave a beautiful, beautiful performance. I mean, it was just, you know, but it is, it is, in the giving of a performance, you literally are giving a truth, hopefully, a truth that is yours, and you're giving it. And if it is, if it is not respected, and I, I don't mean sycophantic, oh, Miss Shaver, can we get your chairs? Nuh uh. Nuh uh. I'm talking this. If you're not listening, if you're not receiving, it's like pearls before swine. And then the horrible part happens where you're inside yourself as an actor, you're pissed off. You think, fuck them. Fuck them. I'll give them intellect. That's it. That's all they get from me. They're not getting my heart. And, um, and then. But then, because you're an artist and because you can't really do that, you have to go all the way back from that emotion back to neutral because like a dancer, you must be in neutral before you leap, right? So you have to come back to neutral so you can begin the ride. Anyway, blah, blah. <laughs> no, I love that. Absolutely. Love that. That's great. And I, it's, I noticed, or I just thought, um, we, we sort of presupposed that everybody knew what Orphan Black was. So just in case you don't, uh, they're clones. So <laughs> Tatiana Maslany plays like six different people. Um, and so we see her in the scene that, we, that uh, Helen shot, and uh, we see the two of them. Uh, how is it when you are, because um, it is an odd situation where you're, you're in a scene where you're shooting two people and one of them actually is not Tatiana. So how, how does that work as a director and how do you get what you need from her when there's someone else there? What, well, what we do is, well, because you're in a scene like that, you're using a uh, motion control camera. So um, I have it very blocked out. That is, that, those are scenes where I absolutely know wh where people are gonna move. Uh, and it's not, well, come on in, let's see where you wanna stand. It is, okay, you're gonna come to here, you're gonna come to here, you're gonna move over there. Then you're going to go here. You know, it's very, very, very mapped out. Then we rehearse the scene with uh, Tatiana's um, double, Catherine, who's a wonderful actress. And we rehearse it from the uh, from the character who is the most proactive in the scene. So in that scene, we we rehearse from Beth's side, and that's the first side that we're going to shoot. Uh, and um, so we rehearse the scene from that with her playing Beth until she feels that she's and I feel and it, until she's found the Beth moments, and then they trade roles and we haven't rolled camera yet. Now we trade roles and she rehearses it from Sarah's side, and although I like I say I've already blocked Sarah, so you, Catherine's not having to figure out where she is. So so then you rehearse the whole thing again, and Catherine is an incredible. Um, not a mimic, but she really emulates when Tatiana finds the tone of something and a rhythm of something, Catherine is very, very able to pick up on that and do that. So then you do that, and then she goes and gets ready to be Beth. And, and then you shoot with Catherine in the standing in on doing that. You shoot it all like that, and then you take Catherine out and you do a pass without Catherine there at all. And then, like in that scene, there's the, the, there's the motion control camera, but then there's also some coverage that are, is done, um, you know, in a, a traditional overs and stuff, and, and tight close-ups that are done separate. So you, you do those things. The time machine has been programmed so that it knows its three moves that it's going to make. So you set it aside for a minute. And then... Off she goes to change, and you have about an hour to an hour and a half while she changes physically changes into the other character, 
during which time you shoot something else with a couple of cameras that are not locked onto the time machine. And uh, then you come back and do it again. Okay. I totally got that. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a lot of logistics. Well, that's working. a lot of logistics. And I mean, and also in that, there was a whole thing where I wanted her to look down the barrel a few times uh, to break the wall and actually look. So there's several times. And so, and I was uncertain, that, you know, so that had to be done kind of separately. And um, yeah. Well, it's interesting. Two things that you've mentioned were um, talking about when an actor is out of time, which yeah. I find kind of interesting how you, and you understand that yeah. language. Uh, and then the other is, is sort of going back to neutral. How difficult is that with, I mean, obviously this proves probably how great Tatiana is, where she has to do that multiple times with multiple characters. Yes, absolutely. So how do you, other than giving them the touch on the shoulder, that's... How do I know whether they're yeah. there or not? I can see it. It's really clear to me. But also, I and then there's just ways, like sometimes I'll just drop in uh, an image. <clears throat> you know, I'll walk over and put my hand on her belly and her uterus and say, She's your, she is your daughter, or, she, what, or whatever. But it's the same, like, when I, this, the first film I directed was uh, Summer's End with James Earl Jones, and, and James called me, and I had a 12-year-old kid and James in it, and James called me, I'd never met the man, and he was a God calling, <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, he's, he's so wonderfully full of mischief, and I hear uh, 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 a friend of mine just went to see him and Cicely Tyson, 175 years between the two of them, on, on Broadway in previews for the gin, uh, uh, the gin game. They're on stage, just the two of them for 90 minutes, and apparently it's fantastic, but anyway. Wow. So James called me just before he was getting on a plane to come to work, and he said, oh, Helen, I uh, have to tell you something. And I said, yes. He said, I'm not a good film actor. And I said, OK. <laughs> you have had me fooled. You're a good actor then, because I never knew. Anyway, and he said, he said that he found it very difficult to, 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 to re do repetitive takes and to tr try and repeat action. And I said, well, we're going to be doing more than one take in things, James, as I'm sure you've done many times. But what all that meant to me was that I never did what that guy did, sitting outside the thing did. Between every take, I physically went to the man, and I would just drop in a couple of words. So I was never asking him to do what he had done before. I, I, I always gave him new images to work with. I mean, and it, it doesn't take much. I mean, you, you can say... I want a hot dog. Do you want to have a hot dog with me at lunch? Or, you, you know, oh, yeah, and the bones. What about your father's bones? You know, and you're gone. Right. And it's, it's like, it's not a big deal. Right. It's just a matter of helping the actor to focus. That's fascinating. Well, speaking of dropping some words in, oh, do we not have time for questions? Oh, oh God, I talk way too no, much. No, no, that's a... No, it was, well, it was fantastic. Look, look, this could have gone on for another hour. I mean, this is great detail and great how to work with actors and how to bring people out and bring up these great images. Well, I you. wish we had more time. Well, so thank you. I'm, let's give I'm Helen sorry. Shaver a round of applause. My pleasure. Thank you. And thanks to everybody for coming out today for our last panel.